we are uh, welcome to live at five. And, and uh, it was a beautiful sunset and, and the light. So this is our background tonight. And every every time we're together at live at five, I can't decide is it is it really should I be talking about the things that were going on on the twelfth of Shvat, which was Monday, or since it's the sun is setting, should we be talking about the thirteenth of Shvat, which is already t- starts at sundown? So th- this perfect twilight picture really captures the mood for me. But uh, whatever day year, whatever Jewish calendar day you're in. Uh, one welcome. Thanks for joining. Um, I wanted to make a couple of, of quick announcements before we get onto the uh, with the show today. I saw this beautiful project that I really do want to announce. Um, uh, uh, one of our community members, Julie Geller, who actually, although she was, grew up here, I think they live in Israel now. I'm not sure, but maybe maybe they're back, and I just haven't met up with them. She has been doing this fantastic little um, generous pro- generous project for first responders. And for the kosher establish, eating establishments in the community by raising money, buying meals from the kosher restaurants, and then going and delivering them as a, as a statement of our thanks and appreciation to various emergency rooms and hospitals. And, and uh, it's a really a beautiful project and you can participate. This is the third round. And 100% of the funds go directly towards this project. And it supports, again, all of these. We're going to be sending a delicious lunch to the, um, to the employees of Denver Health, first responders of Denver Health, from the Eastside Kosher Deli. Uh, it's going to be happening this Thursday. And up until tomorrow at midnight, you can financially participate. It's a win, 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 win. What a beautiful thing. And the way you do that is to send any amount you'd like to um, with Venmo, which is one of those cool, you know, newfangled ways of sending money, tech, technically sending money, use Venmo. And here it is at Julie Geller three. Okay. So we can put that, we'll put that in the chat. It's uh, at Julie J U L I E dash Geller G E L L E R dash three. And uh, if you want to participate in that and it's what a super, a super organization, I'm happy to announce that. I also wanted to announce today's sponsor. Uh, you know, we always have sponsors on the show, and um, this is not a particular sponsor for this show, but for many of the things that the Jewish experience is fortunate to do in the community. We're blessed with many wonderful foundations, and particularly today, I, I'd like to um, recognize one of the recent foundations that's donated to the Jewish experience and has done so uh, annually for many years, the Henry the Harry H. Barron Foundation ZB. So they're a wonderful foundation. In fact, um, as, as you may know, if you're a regular on the show, that a, a few, about a week ago, I had uh, the visit from many, many um, boys from the 12th grade in the yeshiva of Baltimore called Nair Yisrael. And uh, their campus is the Barron campus. And many, many wonderful uh, Torah institutions around the country have bear the, the proud name Barron, which was a, a Colorado family of, uh, of, of significant philanthropy. And so we want to thank the Harry H. Uh, Barron Foundation, ZB. That stands for Zev Barron, one of the, uh, of the wonderful members of the family who sends that to us. Thank you. I also wanted to mention um, a couple of, um, of uh, folks that we want to be uh, praying on behalf of their well-being. In fact, one of them is one of the great rabbis of America, Rabbi Avram Tversky. I just learned that Rabbi Avram Tversky has COVID, and he's not a young man. I, I'm sure he's at least in his 80s, if not his 90s. He's written so, 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 so many books. He's a brilliant teacher and educator, and he was, of course, as we mentioned last week on the show, we were talking about our own Rabbi Tversky, Rabbi Mordechai Tversky, and his father, Sholem. This is a sibling of Rabbi Sholem, of blessed memory. And Yubad L'chaim Tovim, Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heshel Ben Dvor Leah should have Rafu Shlema, if you want to keep him in your thoughts and prayers. Um, I also, I wanted to share the, the most interesting story I heard um, today that, you know, if, are you, I don't know how techy you are up with the Venmo and Bitcoin and all these kinds of high tech uh, financial devices. So Bitcoin is a, is, is some kind of a technology that you could have a, like a kind of a unique, um, uncopyable digital currency. So like a dollar bill is a dollar bill is a dollar bill. And you can't, you know, if you, if you took a photocopier and reprinted this dollar bill over and over and again, well, they'd all have the same number on them and it'd all be it just copies of that original dollar bill. But somehow digitally, you can do that also with, with, with um, a certain type of technology. I forget there's a word for it. Um, I forget exactly what the name is, but there's a certain new technology, which makes it that you can have a digital dollar, which is unique. 
and it's a digital currency. So here's this, this is incredible. And you, you, it doesn't exist. Where does it exist? I don't know. Where can you spend it? I also don't know, but it's, it's worth a lot of money. So th this is a terrible story. My wife told me that she read that there's a fellow who has millions of dollars in Bitcoin currency. And unfortunately, he lost his password to the, to the money. <laughs> he can't retrieve it. He can't retrieve the money. He's got, you, there is, there are, you, you, there's no way. There, you know, that's just one of the interesting things about Bitcoin. Apparently, there's <clears throat> no way to, like normally, you, you forget your password. No big deal. So send me a link by email and I'll reset my password. Nothing doing. <laughs> You're talking, nothing doing. You, you, there's no, re, no password reset options. You get 10 tries to reset your pa password on your Bitcoin currency before you're locked out forever. And he's used eight of them. There's two left. He wrote his password down on a piece of paper and he lost it. Can you imagine like what a story? And, and you know, if he doesn't figure out that password, millions of dollars worth of currency in Bitcoin is just lost. I mean, it's just like a, what a crazy story that is. Unbelievable. You may really, it's like a gut wrencher, you know? It's, oh, I hope he finds it. I hope he finds it. You can imagine when he's going to type in his password one more, he's going to try again, try number nine. And then what happens? <laughs> Terrible. So actually, <clears throat> it reminds me of a story. There was a, uh, there was a, uh, this is the story they tell about this uh, old married couple, husband, wife, they've been married for a long, long time. And, um, and uh, they were kibitzing. They were looking back on their, on their, uh, you know, how they'd made it, how they made it so far, so far, you know, so well, 50 plus years. And, uh, and so uh, he asked her and she said, well, you know what? I have to tell you, I have a secret. And uh, she said, uh, you know, if I was really, if I, if I ever got angry with you, I, um, I would, I would knit, you know, it was my thing. It was my release. I would knit, I would knit these little dolls and she, and she showed, she actually said, she said, and here I, and I would put them in a little box under the, under the bed. So he pulls out the box. Sure enough, there it is. And there's one of these little knit dolls that she made in it. And there's a stack of hundred dollar bills. And he, and, and, and he takes the box and he says, honey, that, you know, I, I, it's, it's amazing. You know, I, 50 plus years, you only got mad at me once you made one doll, you know, there's only one doll here, but what's all that stack of bills and a uh, hundred dollar bills. And so she said, well, that's the money I made from selling all the other dolls. So, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the extra excess cash, uh, around Bitcoin, boy, oh boy, this is a Bitcoin oy story. And we, and we hope that he finds his password. The uh, it also reminds me a little bit about the about the parsha which we're going to talk about this week's parsha is parsha's bishalach and the Jewish people uh, have we got last week and last week's parsha we got out of Egypt this week we get through the sea and the real and the real end of Egyptian slavery and persecution takes place as the Jewish people are spared once again the biggest of the of the miraculous plagues takes place the Jewish people are saved as the Egyptian army is destroyed in the sea. They, the Jewish people walk through on dry land. The Egyptians chase after them to try to get them back. And the sea squashes down them. It happens to be that at that time, the, this amazing wealth fl just floated up from, from the sea. They, the Egyptians' gold and gilt chariots and, and uh, the way they did, they, 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 uh, De, you know, decked out their horses for war with precious gems and everything else. And all of that stuff seems to have uh, been washed up by the sea onto the shore. And the Jewish people left that spot, not only rescued and safe and free of their Egyptian pursuers forever, but very wealthy also. And it was a fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Abraham. The promise was that uh, one day, you know, your, your descendants will be enslaved in a land that's not their own. But I will judge that nation that persecutes and enslaves them, and I will send your descendants out with great wealth. Now, there are two explanations of what the great wealth is. One explanation of the great wealth is this uh, significant, real financial spoils of, the, of, uh, of Egypt that they came away with from the sea. They picked up all the stuff, and the Medrash says that each family was, was uh, trailing behind them like a, 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 a donkey caravan of, of uh, gold and silver from the Egyptians. It was, they, were, they were all very wealthy. The other explanation, of course, is that the real wealth that they got when they got out of Egypt was the Torah. They went to Mount Sinai, and they got that wealth. Because <clears throat> as we say, you know, you can make a lot of money, but you can't take it with you. 
but you could send it on ahead by using it on mitzvahs and wonderful things. We spend our resource, our financial resources in this world on, on, on things like tzedakah and chesed and supporting those in need and, and spending it on beautiful mitzvahs, which we'll talk about more this week. That's a way that we can take the wealth of this world and transmit it into eternal wealth. It's through the Torah and the mitzvahs that we can, we can put it away in our eternal IRA. You could bank it for later. And you know what? You don't have to worry about your password. Meanwhile, you should worry about your passwords. That's uh, the moral of the story is, of the Bitcoin story is, that, that um, I have this little app. I, it's a little app on my phone, and I want to recommend that everybody consider getting an app on your phone that is a storage vault for your passwords. Then you only have to remember one password. You could write it down. You could share it with some, you know, with your friends and family if you want to for safekeeping. You could keep it in one place. You only have to remember one password, and in and behind that password is readily accessible are all your other passwords. So I think it's a very, this is just a word to the wise. Do something like that. And if you have it on your phone, you usually have your phone with you because we're married to those things. We have them at the hip. And anytime you need your password, you for sure have your phone on you because you don't need your passwords on Shabbos. And so you have it behind security. That's just a word to the wise. One other uh, thing that you could do, which is a good idea, is, um, is you could have a what I'm going to call a, a convention for your passwords. Okay. Now this is someone, I can't remember where I picked this trick up, but it's uh, also just a little wise thing I found, I found out, which is if you always use a formulaic way for your passwords, because again, today we need a million passwords for your banking websites and your, and your, and your utility websites. It always bothers me that the, the most strict um, security on any website that I have is Excel. Like, like what's going to happen? Someone's going to break into my, my account and pay my electric bill for me, but they make me put my social security number in there. My bank doesn't make me do that, and Excel does. I, for, I fail to understand that. But we all have loads of passwords, and you could have a convention that all your passwords follow the same pattern, and you never have to forget them again. So let's say, for example, let's say your last name is, um, is Smithstein, so you could put as your password, you could put like, you know, uh, 613 Smith, uh, you know, one Steen. And then you could put the, the name of the website where you're making this password for. So if you, if you use, let's say, you know, um, Wells Fargo, you could have always the same beginning and then put Wells Fargo at the end or just put WF or something like that. And all your passwords would always be, always be the same with a little minor variation at the end. And that way you can always remember them. And the, and the, the convention is to that what goes on at the end is, um, is relevant to that site. So you never forget your password ever again. I, someone taught me this years ago and it's been really helpful, I have to say. So that's, uh, that is not from the Parsha, but it, it's just something I thought I would share from the Bitcoin story and maybe it'll be useful to you. Now um, today's topic is with uh, with a uh, with a uh, half a uh, half of the show left. I wanted to um, get down to Tubishvat. Tubishvat is this Wednesday night and Thursday. And if you're going to get ready and celebrate it and know what it's about, so we have to talk about it in advance a little bit. Now I'm not sure that there is a lot of tremendous preparation that you need to do, but let's talk about it. Two Bishvat. Two Bishvat. We said the word two is not the number two. It's actually two Hebrew letters, tes and vav, which you pronounce them, it sounds like the word two. But what they are is nine and six in gematria, a numerical value, and together nine and six makes 15. And that is the way that we refer to the 15th of the month, the two. So some months, the 15th of the month is relevant, like av. So we have a special day on the calendar, tu ba'av, which is the 15th of the month of av, or tu b'shvat, which is the 15th of the month of shvat. So today was, let's see, today, I think Monday is the 12th, Wednesday the 13th, Tuesday is the 13th, Wednesday is the 14th, and then the 15th is Wednesday night, Thursday. And the 15th of Shvat has, is, 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 is what is interestingly is this minor holiday. And I'm going to say the word minor because it's quite minor. We have major league holidays, we have minor league holidays, and then we have the you know, like sort of the uh, community league, which is the old guys who you know that should have stopped playing ball a long time ago, and they and they use a lot of Ben Gay, and they take Advil before they start playing. This holiday is in that third league because it's really not a, not a holiday per, per se at all. Um, 
It's not a holiday. We're not celebrating anything that happened in Jewish history. Nothing happened on the 15th of Shvat in Jewish history that we need to commemorate. And this is not a day which, which is somehow intrinsic and essential to, the, to the, the, the identity of the Jewish people. All of our holidays come from, even the fast days, they all come from things that happened in Jewish history that we need to, we need to tap into, learn from, and do something about. And the major ones would be the ones in the, uh, written up in the Torah, and the minor ones would be ones that are commemorating events that happened after that, like Purim, Hanukkah. If Purim and Hanukkah are minor holidays, then Tu B'Shvat is, like we say, is in the farm leagues. Now, the, uh, the source of it, though, let's talk about what, it, what, what the source of it. The source of it is like this. In the first Mishnah, in the tractate Rosh Hashanah, so the Mishnah is, is, the, is the teachings of the oral Torah. The, uh, the first record of them is, is the, the compilation that we refer to as the Mishnah, has different sections. And one section is about Rosh Hashanah, the holiday Rosh Hashanah. And it talks about a lot of Rosh Hashanahs, a lot of New Years, because we have several New Years throughout the year. We have, we have a bunch. We have a bunch of New Years at different times throughout the year. It's, it's like, like, like in our own lives, we have New Year's for different things. So, for example, um, the, the school New Year probably starts in, like, September, you know? And when a person goes into the third grade in September, they stay in the third grade all the way till you know, the end of the year, which is in May, right? Can you imagine if January 1st, all the third graders became fourth graders? That'd be kind of weird, right? So, the New Year for a school, school calendar is, is not January 1st. Or sometimes people will have a fiscal year that's, uh, you know, July 1st or June 30th or something like that. You could have that. You could have multiple New Year's, depending on what you want to talk about. And the Jewish people have multiple New Year's. So one of the New Year's that we have um, is this date, the 15th of Shvat. It's a New Year of sorts. What is it a New Year for? Well, if you are um, a farmer in the land of Israel that owns an orchard of fruit trees and you're growing fruits, let's say you're growing apples or you're growing pomegranates, grapes, olives, let's say you, you're, you have an orchard, then every year you have the mitzvah to tithe your crop of fruits. Then you're going to take a little bit and you're going to give it as what's called truma, which is your first tithe. Then it goes to the, the kohanim, goes to the priest. And then you take a second tithe, which is, which is a larger percentage, and it goes to the, the Levites, etc. And there's a bunch of things you do with it. Some go to the poor. Sometimes you're going to take it to Jerusalem yourself and eat it. But there's a variety of obligatory tithes for a, for a, for a farmer of, uh, of, of all kinds of things. We're specifically talking about the fruits of trees. Now, how do you know where to draw the line between last year's crop and this year's crop so that you tie this ones and you finish and then you start counting again and you tie the new ones? You need a date in the calendar where we call it the new year, called last year and the new year. And that date is the 15th of Shvat. And that's what it is. It's really a very technical day. It's a, it, it's, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not someone who's tithing tree fruits that you grew in the land of Israel, it really has very little relevance to you per se. It, there's no other obligation to it. Um, and, and for that reason, you know, Mishnah mentions it. This is the, the new year. And that's really it. There's no, there's no track date about Tu Bishvat. There's, no, there's nothing more in the Mishnah said or the Talmud itself. The only recognition of the holiday of Tu Bishvat for us today in, 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 any, in any real practical way is that if you're familiar with the daily prayers of the Jewish people, the daily liturgy, we omit one particular section of the prayer service, which is called Tachanun, which is uh, that, that prayer service is, is, a, is a, a pleading, supplicating type of prayer, begging God, save us, help us, rescue us from, from distress. And on any day that's, that's, that's like a joyous day, that's a happy day where we're not thinking about how bad things are, but how good things were, we don't say that. We don't say that type of, that part of the service. Shabbos, we never, we don't say Tachanon on Shabbos. Yom Tiv, we don't say Tachanon on Yom Tiv. Whenever we're tapping in on a, onto a holiday, a festive moment where we're thinking about how great things were and how great things will be again, we're, we're not pleading, save us, rescue us. We leave that, that part of the service out. And we leave that part of the service out. We omit Tachanon on Tu Bishvat. So that's something that you would do if you go to if you're if you go to synagogue or even if you're just praying at home. You say your daily the daily uh, prayers of the Jewish people uh, on a normal Thursday. You would say that, but this Thursday 
we're going to miss it out. We're going to omit it. Now, the other the other thing that's 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 often uh, associated with Tubishvat, uh, particularly uh, today. Um, is that is is that because that this how this is a moment in the calendar, a day in the calendar that has a significance for the fruits of the trees, then it has become a time when we when we do other things when we think of the fruits of the trees fondly. So it, one traditional thing that people do on that day is that they they take an opportunity to pray for a beautiful s robe for this year. What's the, the the most famous tree fruit mitzvah that we're going to do between now and the next Tu is we're going to take a little yellow tree fruit called an esrog and we're going to wave it on the holiday of Sukkot. And that tree fruit, we try to get the nicest one we can. You don't want an old rotten one or a very lumpy one or one with funny colors or pimply. You want like a nice looking esrog. It's a, it could be a matter of pride. You know, you can make the other guys jealous in synagogue, you know, what, whatever it takes. You know, you want to have a nice looking s rug, right? I, I jest about that. But you could, uh, you, at least you want a kosher one and better. And so the, the time to particularly ask for a beautiful tree fruit mitzvah s rug would be on the tree fruit New Year's, and that would be Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah of tree fruits, which is Tubishvat. So make sure Wednesday night, Thursday, if you're, uh, if you're, you know, going to be shopping later on for a for a for a nice uh, esrog on Amazon or eBay, make sure that you pray on Tubishvat that you should be able to get an, a good one. Okay, that's one thing that people do. The other thing is that do seem to be some some um, I don't know how deep they go, but some some more mystical traditions to think about about trees and tree. Um, tree lessons, tree teachings, tree associations. I don't know how strictly, uh, you know, uh, uh, ancient this is, but there's definitely a lot of that uh, today. So some will make, and I believe that there's uh, there, there's some of the, of the great Kabbalists uh, taught us how to do this. They actually make a Tubishvat Seder, like we make a Pesach Seder, Passover Seder. We have a Tubishvat Seder at which we would, we would actually try to eat 15 types of, of tree fruits. Now, just interestingly, I don't know if you recognize this, but 15 is the number of steps of the Passover Seder. 15 is a very meaningful number. It's not only the 15th day of the month, but if you look closely at the Seder, and, or, or if you'll go back to some Live at Five reruns from uh, before Passover, you'll, you'll, you'll remember clearly the steps of the Seder are 15. So we're doing a 15-step Seder. We're going to eat 15 types of tree fruit. That would be, we could have wine would count, red wine, white wine, maybe that's two. You could have all kinds of fruits. You could have olives and pomegranates, dates, figs, apples, oranges, peaches, plums, all kinds of tree fruits. and Except for peanuts, all other nuts are tree fruits. Tr- to also, so you could have cashews and almonds and pistachios and walnuts and you know and lychee nuts and all those kind of, all these kind of things that grow from trees until you get to fifteen. Make sure and make the blessing on tree fruits. Pere periha eight, and uh, and that would be a way to to recognize the uh, you know that God blesses us with beautiful tree fruits. But I'm going to share two other quick thoughts for you before we sign off for you to enrich your tubishvat. <clears throat> number one is this. The, if you think for a second about what we, what's our basic sustenance, nourishment, what we generally eat. So you'd, you'd, you really start to think of like the staff of life, which is bread, which are grains, things that grow from the ground. You know, that's your vegetables, grains, you know, that's your real, that's your, that's your, your basics. The fruits yeah, it's dessert. It's like extras. You know, if you're eating an apple at a meal, it's probably not the main course. It's probably not even a side dish. I mean, sometimes we make that yummy apple crumble that we eat during the meal sometimes, but I always feel guilty about that. Usually if you're having apple at a meal, it's dessert, right? That's right. Because fruits are sweet and we bring those out at the end and it's dessert and it's yummy and it's sweet. And you know what? So when we eat tree fruits, what we should be thinking is, this is the stuff that God gave us to eat and enjoy, not because we need it to survive, but because God wants us to have a tasty, pleasant life. He loves us and he gives us treats. Tree fruits are treats. You don't need them. You can live without, fine without them. I, I don't, go ask your nutritionist. They'll agree with me. But the, the sweet, free fruits are treats. 
and God loves us and he gives us treats to eat. And so when you're, when you're celebrating the fruits of the tree, the gift of the fruits of the tree, it's, it's an extra sign. It's not, it's like the candy man gives out in, in the synagogues. You know, there's always that guy in the synagogue that, that all the kids walk over and he's got a pocket full and he's giving out treats. He wants to give out treats. Tree fruits are God's treats because he loves us. So that's a two bishvat thought. Very beautiful. And another one, I'll give you just one more. The, uh, the, very traditionally, the, that, um, that we say that people are like trees. And, uh, and we have fruits as well. We bear fruits. What are the fruits that we bear? The fruits of our trees are our deeds, our decisions, our choices, our accomplishments, the things that we do that are worthwhile. Those are like the fruits that we, that we sweeten the world with. And we're like a tree. A tree has roots and, and on one end and gives fruits on the other end. But people are like upside down trees because our roots are in heaven and our fruits are down here in this world on the ground. So we're upside down trees. And if we really think about that and we tap into the fact that, that we are sweetening the world with the fruits of our actions, our accomplishments, our decisions, that what we do in the world, that's the way that we stay rooted in heaven but we, we accomplish wonderful things down here, then we have additional reasons to celebrate a Tu Bishvat, the celebration of the fruits of the trees. That's a couple of thoughts on Tu Bishvat, what it is and what it's not. Hope you got my rhyme there. Hope uh, everybody has a, uh, a wonderful rest of your day. Have a healthy day and a holy day. God willing, we'll see you tomorrow on Live at Five. 